All right, everybody, it's 10.30, gonna start on time. This is Tom Bennett. Thanks, for, thanks everybody for getting on during these unprecedented times. As ABB continues to help our members through these trying times of the coronavirus outbreak, we have recruited Laura H. Corbo from White & Williams LLP to present a COVID-19 employment management webinar. Laura represents employers in employment litigation and counsels clients on a variety of employment-related issues. She has extensive knowledge of federal, state, and local employment laws and regularly counsels employers on a host of personnel and human resource issues. This webinar will highlight managing COVID-19 in the workplace, Family First Act, and reductions in the workforce, temporary and permanent. All right, Laura, take it away. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you so much, Tom, and thank you everyone for, for getting on. Look, as Tom said, I know that we're navigating both unprecedented and trying times. We're dealing with probably the most significant health and economic crisis of most of our lifetimes. And figuring out how to manage our businesses and employees through this crisis can be, can be very difficult. And what we wanted to do today was provide you with some general guidelines, as well as alert you to some of the new legal requirements that you as employers are going to um, be faced with um, given the passage of a recent uh, act that Congress passed just last week, the Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. So let me start with just giving you guys some general guidelines as to what you should be thinking about and what you should be doing to navigate through this crisis. The first thing is that government guidelines should be your floor look for better or for worse, the government is steering the ship through this crisis. And what federal, state, and local governments are telling you to do or recommending you do should be what you're following. You may wanna go above them um, and do additional things, but at minimum, you should be doing what the government is telling you. And I say this knowing that, you know, just yesterday, the Senate passed a major stimulus package, which has a whole host of things. As I said last week, uh, Congress passed the Families First um, Act, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And state and local governments are just flooding um, out new legislation on, on almost a daily, sometimes hourly basis. So you've got to stay abreast of what those guidelines are. You also need to communicate regularly. Um, you know, communication in a crisis is key. Um, and how you communicate both with your employees and with your customers, you know, will kind of help you know make you stand out in in navigating this crisis you also need to be flexible look um you know we're kind of there's a major uh tornado coming at us and there's not necessarily a straight rigid path to safety um you're going to have to be flexible and you're going to have to make a lot of moves to to guide your your business um through this so flexibility is going to be key and lastly, you're not in this alone. You need to reach out for legal guidance, whether it's to your own counsel, through the guidance that the folks at AVB Brand Source are, are putting out. At the end of the webinar, I'm gonna give you a link to our firm's website. Um, we're putting out multiple client alerts on a daily basis on different topics regarding this. So stay abreast of those um, and reach out for assistance um, because this is not gonna be something that's easy to navigate on your own. So one of the first questions I've been getting from employers, um, you know, as this crisis has progressed is what is my obligation as an employer to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace? What should I be doing? And I would say we have to start with the government guidance and rely on that. Now that government guidance has changed quite significantly over the past couple of weeks. We started with telling people it's okay, just wash your hands, you'll be fine, to you know, impose social distancing measures to shut your doors um, because we have to close you down and make everybody go home. You gotta be abreast of what that, go that government guidance uh, is saying and rely upon it. The other thing you should do in addition to what the government is saying is consider your industry standards. You know, the commissioner of the NBA, it seems like a, a decade ago, but just a, a week or two ago, stopped basketball. Once he did that, all other sports followed. 
you've got to know what your the folks in your industry are doing, and that's why you've got to be relying on the um, everyone at AVB Brand Source to to help keep you abreast of what the industry standards are. Another thing that has been consistent throughout this crisis is that you should be requiring employees to stay home if they are sick, and you should send employees home who are sick. So if somebody is sick, um, you've got to send them home. Um, or if they're exhibiting um, symptoms, you have to send them home. Now, a lot of employers are saying, well, if I have somebody who's sick or afraid of getting sick, what, am I, what are my obligations? Um, I'm just gonna really quickly say that there may be some obligation to accommodate employees who have underlying health conditions due to a concern about having to uh, come to work on a daily basis if you're still operating um, your business in the workplace. Um, there has not yet been anything that said anybody who just has a general fear of exposure that they have any specific protection, but it's something you're gonna have to navigate and you may have to provide certain accommodations. Do those accommodations include, for example, telling people they can work remotely or work from home? Let me just tell you what the law says. The law says it has to be a reasonable accommodation. For many of your businesses, it may or may not be reasonable for somebody to work from home. A, a example, you know, a salesperson um, in one of your stores, you know, their job is to sell people to the customers coming into the store. If they're home, they can't perform their job. So that accommodation wouldn't be reasonable. It might be reasonable for somebody who does what I would call um, back office work, your payroll clerk, or somebody who might be doing, um, you know, accounting or, or a, more of a desk job. But again, you have to kind of consider those things and evaluate them on a case by case basis. Another consistent standard we've, we've seen is that if, if an employee does um, either test positive or have an exposure to COVID-19, you should ask them to tell you so that you could take appropriate steps, which probably are gonna mean you send the employee home and don't have a further exposure in your workplace. Taking employees' temperatures. Now, a week ago, I would have told you that it's legally prohibited to take an employee's temperature because under the Americans with Disabilities Act, it would have been considered what we call a medical examination, and it, would, it was a big no-no for employee, employee, employers to do that. That guidance in light of the COVID crisis changed very recently, and the guidance is now that employers are able to take employees' temperatures in light of this crisis. Does that mean you should? Again, you're gonna have to balance what the interests are. Um, one, potential issue that I see, and I think you need to proceed with caution, is if you have somebody taking temperatures, how are you doing that? Are you exposing that person who is taking the temperature? The other thing is if you decide you're gonna take temperatures, um, for example, to assure a customer whose home you might be going into that the, the individual is not um, exhibiting any known symptoms, um, you want to make sure that if you're doing that, you're, you're doing it in a um, consistent manner and you're not choosing certain employees um, where you're targeting them to take their temperatures. We've seen a lot of guidance that there's a concern, for example, um, because the crisis started in China where Asian employees were targeted. You can't target people based upon a protected class. So you've got to come up with some reasonable, um, legitimate and non-discriminatory reasons should you impose this. So if you're gonna do this, I would just recommend you, you talk to legal counsel just to make sure there's no um, minefields for, for this because I, I do see problems that could, could come into play down the future. So I would just proceed with a little bit of caution if you decide it's necessary to take employees' temperatures in the workplace. The other thing you should be doing is, you know, imposing social distancing measures and discouraging workers from using other people's phones, desks, office space, you know, keep everybody um, who's in your workplace as separate as possible. 
And then finally, you should be um, conducting regular cleaning and disinfection. The CDC has issued um, guidance on the types of cleaning and disinfection uh, procedures that you should be implementing, the types of products um, that will help um, you know, kill off the virus if someone you know, touches a surface. So um, you should be imposing those cleaning and disinfection measures. Now, what happens if an employee who works for you has a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19? What should you be doing and what shouldn't you be doing? Let's start with the do's. First, you're gonna rely on government guidance. And as I said, government guidance changes on a daily basis, but you're gonna to wanna to consult, you know, if you find out about that case, you're gonna to wanna to go on, your, on the CDC's website and your local or state health officials website to see if there's any additional thing they want you to do. Currently, the CDC is saying if somebody tests positive or has a suspected case of it, you have to send home any employee who came into close contact with that person. And you have to close off the areas that were used by the employee and then follow the CDC guidance for cleaning. Um, so those are the do's. You also should alert, if you're in a landlord situation, you should alert your landlord or your building management because they may have some of the responsibility for cleaning or for clean, cleaning common areas. What shouldn't you do? You don't wanna disclose the identity of the affected employee. Um, that is a privacy violation, so you can't say, you know, John Smith has tested positive for COVID-19. You just can't disclose the name of the employee. You also shouldn't appear defensive. You know, I've seen clients in this situation act almost apologetic for the fact that somebody in their workplace has tested positive. Again, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, given the unfortunate amount of community spread, you know, don't apologize for the fact that somebody, you know, who unfortunately is one of your employees has either got, gotten the virus or come into contact. We don't know where this came from. You don't know where the exposure came from. And it, 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 it's, it's beyond all of our pay grades to figure that out. So I wouldn't appear as though it's, it's somehow your fault. You also don't wanna cause panic. Again, you wanna follow the guidance. You don't need to tell people, you know, okay, somebody's tested positive. Everybody needs to duck and, gov um, duck and cover. It's just got to be, um, you know, telling people what happened and um, what their next steps are. But it doesn't have to be a panic uh, situation. So if you have a, a confirmed case of COVID-19, who do you tell and what do you tell them? Let's start out with the who. Oops. Okay. Again, as I said before, the CDC recommends anyone who comes into close contact. What they're saying close contact is, is three to six feet. Um, and it's during the 14 day period prior to you learning about the um, confirmed or suspected case. 14 days is the, the date the doctors are saying is the period for the, the virus. You also should think about if you're telling those people who are within three to six feet, and again, many of you are operating smaller businesses, um, you may have to tell everybody in the workplace. Uh, all of us know that employees talk amongst themselves, um, and it may be better, even if there are employees who didn't come into close contact with somebody, for them to hear about it from you, rather through an employee rumor mill, which could cause you know, further panic and um, you know, further rumors to spread. So what do you tell somebody when, uh, tell your employees when somebody has tested positive? I always like to rely upon the, the late great Peter Falk um, from the Columbo series. And he would say, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Well, that's what you want to communicate. It's just the facts as you know them. Somebody, you know, who was in our workplace tested positive on X date. They were last in the, in the workplace on X date. 
the people who have come into close contact have been notified. Um, we have taken appropriate cleaning measures or you know, we have closed our store, whatever it is, just the facts in a very dry matter of fact manner. You wanna communicate the steps you've taken, for example, cleaning, you've closed down for a short period of time, you've sent people home, whatever it is you've done, again, step by step, very dry, very matter of fact. You also want to emphasize in these communications that you know safety of your employees and customers is a top priority and you're doing everything you can to, to help assure that. And you want to encourage employees to follow the government guidelines um, so that they can take whatever measures they believe are appropriate to protect themselves. In addition, to the extent you have this, um, there are other available resources that may help your employees. For example, some health benefits plans offer things like employee assistance programs, knowing that this is a very scary time for our employees. Um, this may be something that they want to reach out to. They also have, a, there's a number of telehealth services. We could just remind employees where those things are, how they can come into contact with them. Um, so if they want to go and talk to their doctor, um, about what they should do knowing about the, the exposure in your workplace, they can have that conversation. Or if they want to talk to somebody for mental health reasons, if there is an EAP program, you can refer them to that. So turning now to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. As I said, late last week, Congress passed an extremely comprehensive act that applies uh, puts additional burdens on almost all employers and kind of sorting through this and knowing what this is all about um, is a little bit difficult, difficult, but I think we're going to take it step by step, give you guys as much information so that you know what to do um, with res regard to this act. I will say that uh, the Department of Labor put out regulations um, yesterday and then again late last night and they're continuing to update them. So things are changing a little bit, but the basics are here and let, let's go through what they mean. So what is this, all, this act all about and what does it require? Well, there's really two components of it. There's what we call a paid emergency sick leave component and a paid emergency family leave component, okay? The paid emergency sick leave requires employers to pay 10 days or up to 80 hours of sick leave to employees who are affected or become sick um, or can't go out of their homes because of a quarantine due to COVID-19, okay? The paid FMLA provides, requires employers to provide up to 10 weeks of paid emergency family leave for those employees who can't work because their child's school or daycare um, has, has closed, okay? Employers are required to pay this, but there is a dollar for dollar reimbursement through a payroll tax credit. So the government, anything you pay out with regard to this leave is gonna come back to you um, through a payroll tax credit. I know one of the concerns is, you know, the timing of this is everyone's business is struggling through the economic um, impact of this, of this um, crisis. Um, and you know, we saw the CARES Act has, has recently passed the Senate. We expect it to pass the House today, and I believe further relief will come to small businesses. In the meantime, though, they have put the burden on the employer to pay this with the idea that you're gonna get the money back. So which employers must comply with the act? Well, it's all employers with 500 or fewer employees, okay? They've taken it out of the big guys and they put it on the little guys. Now I know that some of you say, okay, I don't have more than 50 employees, so I'm not subject to the FMLA, so I'm not gonna listen anymore. Please continue to listen because this applies to all employers with 500 or fewer employees, even those with less than 50 employees, this obligation is there. There is a possible exemption for portions of this that apply to um, the child care leave, 
um, for employers with 50 or less employees. And what the law says, you can get an exemption from the Department of Labor if this burden is going to affect the quote unquote viability of the business. Okay, what does that mean? And all lawyers are jumping up and down trying to figure out what viability of the business means. Well, the answer is let's stay tuned. DOL's most recent regs, which came out last night, said employers should start to be documenting why they think they, they shouldn't have to apply for this, but we're gonna let you know what our standard is. They haven't let us know yet, um, so kind of stay tuned for that. And again, I'm gonna provide you with a link to the DOL's website where their regulations are so that you can find out more information after this webinar. So when does this act take effect? It starts on April 2nd and it ends on December 30th of uh, this year. So it's, 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 a, it's a finite act, it's not permanent, it's going from April 2nd in a few days to the end of this year, okay? There is a notice requirement under the act which requires employees to send out notice to their employees telling them what rights they have under the act. DOL just put out the notice. I'm gonna, there's a link at the end of the webinar to the notice, which you would have to place in a conspicuous place in your workplace. Um, if you're still operating, that would mean you know, a break room or wherever it is you put your workers comp or other type of similar posters. Um, if your employees are working remotely, you can email the notice, okay? So that is, that is the, the, the impact. This isn't a permanent act. This is just a crisis-based act. So which employees get this paid sick leave? Remember the paid sick leave is 10 days or up to 80 hours of paid sick leave. Okay, the, the paid sick leave is split into two components. There's what I'm gonna call employee leave and that's where an employee is unable to work or telework because of certain reasons. And then there's caring leave where an employee is unable to work or telework because the employee is either caring for somebody with the virus or uh, has a kid in school whose school is closed and they have to care for that child and can't work. So let me just go through the, the legal standards, how this, the act breaks it down. For the employee leave, you have to be subject to a quarantine or an isolation order. And we've seen some of these orders in, in, uh, in some states and cities or you have to be under a physician order to self-quarantine. That's where your doctor tells you you shouldn't, either you've been exposed to the virus um, and you shouldn't go out or um, you're exhibiting symptoms and they're not sure yet, so they don't want you out. Or you're seeking some sort of medical treatment due to a symptom of COVID-19. Again, DOL just put out some guidance that said you will need some documentation from employees showing that they qualify for this leave. It may be a copy of the isolation order or a note from the doctor saying that they're under order to self-quarantine. The caring leave is you're, you know, you're, you're, you're caring for somebody who's under one of these things, an isolation order or a physician's order to self-quarantine. The interesting thing about this is it's not limited to family members. So it could be somebody's roommate. It doesn't have to be an immediate family member. Um, so the, just, just, just to let you know, as long as the person is caring for somebody who's under that isolation order or a order to self-quarantine. Or you're caring for a child whose school or daycare is closed or the daycare provider, your babysitter is unavailable because of the COVID-19. So those are the, the reasons that people would be able to get this paid sick leave. And again, the paid sick leave is 10 days or up to 80 hours. And then they just throw in this experiencing other substantially similar uh, condition as specified for this by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. They're gonna issue regulations as to what that might be. Um, it hasn't been clear yet. So how much 
do you pay the employees for this type of sick leave? Again, we talked about the, the amount of time, 10 days up to 80 hours. How much of that do you pay? Well, for the employee leave, okay, and remember that's the people who are subject to the quarantine or under a physician's order to, to be home or who, ha who are getting medical treatment for COVID-19, you're paying them 100% of their regular rate of pay, which is capped at $511 a day. For the caring leave, again, those are the people who are caring for somebody who's, who are subject to an isolation order or a physician's order to self-quarantine or whose kid's school is closed and they can't work. It's partial pay at two thirds of the regular rate of pay capped at $200 a day. Now, how do you figure out what the regular rate of pay is? Again, regulations just came out that you do a look back of what the employee was making over the previous six months. Um, so that if you have an employee, for example, who's uh, paid on a commission basis, you would look at their the rate of pay that, and take the average rate of pay they were paid for the previous six month period um, starting from the leave. And this applies to full and part-time employees. So your part-time employees are not exempt from this as they would be from other sick leave and FMLA leaves. This is, this is all employees. So a lot of employers have said, well, what about my existing policy? I have PTO I offer my employees. So is this, how does this, if I give them PTO, my, my PTO, do they get this in addition? The answer is yes. This emergency paid sick leave is in addition to any existing or PTO time that they may have. Again, though, you're getting the dollar for dollar reimbursement on the paid sick leave, the emergency paid sick leave, you're not getting it on your own PTO time. So uh, just, just remember to consider that. The act also says, you know what employers, you can't start changing your PTO policies and your sick leave policies to take account for this. In other words, knowing that this is out there, you can't tell employees, well, we normally gave you five sick days, now we're only gonna give you two, or we're not gonna give you them anymore. Um, the act prohibits you from changing it um, to avoid, to, to either account for or avoid the emergency paid sick leave obligation. A number of states have come out with their own sick leave laws pertaining to um, COVID-19. So far, the act is silent on how these laws will um, interact. Some of the state laws, I know New York's, for example, does have a statement saying, well, if the federal government is requiring you to do it, um, we're okay, we just wanna make sure it's covered. Um, but there may be some, some um, confusion as to you know, how the, the state and the federal work here. So again, we're waiting for guidance on that. Now, who is eligible for this FMLA leave? This is what I'm calling the school closure leave, okay? Now, this is both full or part-time employees who've worked 30 days and who are unable to work or telework due to the closure of your child's school or place of care. A couple of things to think about here. Anyone who is subject to the FMLA knows that FMLA typically applies to full-time employees, not part-time employees. This is both full and part-time. FMLA also requires you to have worked 1,250 hours um, in the previous calendar year. This says 30 days, so you only have to have 30 days. And in the event of an employee, again, this is just recently passed, who was laid off, if you bring that in, you know, due to COVID-19, if they're laid off after March 1st and then brought back, they take, they look, they're not, it's not as though there's a break. They look at the, the time, if they were employed for you 30 days prior to March 1st, the calendar doesn't reset so that they are, they are eligible for this leave if somebody is laid off or furloughed and then brought back. So in terms of the FMLA leave, and again, this is where somebody's school is closed, how much time off do you have to give them and how much pay do you have to give them? The time off is 12 weeks of job protected leave, okay? That means after the 12 weeks, 
you have to return the employee to the same or equivalent position. Okay, there is an exception for employers with less than 25 where they're saying, well, you have to make reasonable efforts to restore the job. Again, reasonable is a wishy-washy lawyer word. What that's going to mean, um, you know, will be sorted out, but you have to make some attempt to try to get them back to their job. Knowing that, does that mean that if that person is on FMLA leave, you can't lay them off if you're laying off and you know, other people? The answer is no, but you can't target them. Um, and if they are on this leave and you're still operating and you still have other employees, um, you got to bring them back when the leave is over. How much, oh, the other thing is if you are subject to the FMLA, this leave is not in addition to other family and medical leave that might be available. For example, if somebody takes an FMLA leave um, and is pregnant and then takes, it takes this leave now and then gets pregnant um, six months from now and has a baby and wants to go out, the 12 weeks is the 12 weeks. It doesn't, it doesn't give them a right to an additional 12 weeks. Um, similarly for somebody who might have a health condition or be caring for somebody with a, with a health condition. So it's a one-shot deal. This just expands the FMLA to say that you have this protected leave um, for this situation, which is caring for a, a child um, whose school is closed. So how much pay do you pay them for the FMLA leave? It's two thirds of the regular rate of pay capped at $10,000 in the aggregate, okay? And it's for up to 10 weeks and it's available after the first 10 weeks um, of, after the first 10 days of the leave. So what does that mean? You have somebody whose child school is closed and they can't work. For the first 10 days, they can get two thirds pay under the emergency sick leave that we just talked about. And after that, they can get 10 weeks of this FMLA paid at two thirds their regular rate of pay, okay? So they are getting 12 weeks of pay, just 10 of them are under the sick leave provision and the other, uh, just 10 days are under the sick leave provision and the remainder of the 10 weeks are under this FMLA provision. One thing about both of these leaves is you should be tracking and alerting your payroll providers um, that there should be some designation if you are paying out these payments um, because you're gonna wanna get the, re the refund from the government and the tax credit from the government once you've done it. So you're gonna have to show that you paid out this, that the payments you made to the employee for this type of leave were made and have a designation similar to the way you would designate if somebody was taking sick leave or vacation time. What if you're shut down or you had to lay off or furlough your employees? The employee then is not eligible for the leave during any shutdown due to public emergency, and they're not eligible if they're um, temporarily or permanently laid off or furloughed. So if they're not working for you and they've gone on unemployment, this leave does not apply to them. However, there is an anti-retaliation provision in the statute which says, you know, you can't target somebody who takes the leave or who requests the leave for a layoff or furlough. So if you're planning a layoff or furlough, which we're going to get into in a moment, you know, you can't go after the person because they've asked for either the emergency sick leave or the emergency family and medical leave. Okay, and I know there's a lot to that um, Families First um, Act. Again, I'm gonna refer you to some additional sites at the end of the program because there's a lot to digest there. And we're gonna keep you guys um, and the folks at AVB and BrandSource up to date on any additional guidance that comes out so that you guys can stay abreast of this. But in addition to navigating this uh, new act, given the vast economic crisis we all find ourselves in, 
a lot of employers have considered or are considering you know, reducing costs, including reductions in their payroll costs and, and you know, letting some of their employees go. So if you are in that boat and you're considering them, what are some of the things we should be thinking about and knowing? Let me give you some very basic things. First of all, a lot of people ask me, well, what's the difference between a layoff and a furlough? I hear these terms, what, what's, what's one and what's the other? A layoff is a permanent separation. You're telling the employee, I can no longer have you on my staff be, and I'm going to just part ways with you. It's not because of a performance issue, you know, where it's a, what we call a termination for cause, but we're laying you off because I just can't afford to keep, you go, to keep this going and we have to say goodbye. It's permanent. That employee no longer would be eligible for any health benefits you may be providing. They would be eligible for unemployment benefits, okay? as opposed to somebody who's, a who's on a furlough. A furlough is a temporary se separation. That is, you say to somebody, I can't keep you on my payroll right now until this thing is over. I'm hoping it's over in a, in a couple of weeks, in a couple of months, whatever it is, but for that period of time, I'm gonna furlough you. But I, my intent is to bring you back. I don't want to part ways with you. I still want you part of my business. I just can't afford to pay you right now. So um, we're, 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 it's temporary. They typically remain eligible for your health benefits, although you need to consult your health plan. Each plan is a little bit different. Most plans that I have seen have, have allowed employees on furlough to remain eligible for the benefits. And the employee becomes eligible for unemployment during the furlough period. Now, one thing you have to remember is if you furlough an employee where the separation is temporary, you can't allow that employee to perform any work during the furlough period. That means you can't be reaching out to the employee and asking them to respond to an email. You can't be asking the employee to just come in to, to fix the lights or whatever it is. You let that employee go, they're on furlough, their pay is now shifted to unemployment. If you still have them doing work, you're going to get into major trouble with unemployment and I've seen um, uh, clients have criminal, be exposed to criminal liability for doing something like this. So really important, even though the separation is temporary, if you're furloughing them and transferring them to unemployment or you're not paying them anything, that employees should not be doing any more work for you. Some employers are doing what we're calling a rolling furlough, where they're asking an employee, uh, you know, I'll allow you to work for one week, then be on furlough the next week. You can do that, but just make sure that during the week that they're on furlough, they're not having any contact with business. Another way to cut costs um, that a lot of employers are considering are salary reductions or reductions in hour. What's the difference? We're basically talking about time versus money. A reduction in hours, the employee basically does that. They work less hours. Um, instead of working Monday through Friday, they're gonna only work Mondays and Wednesdays. Instead of working nine to five, they're gonna work nine to four, uh, nine to two there's some sort of reduction in the hours. For those employees who are on your health benefits plan, there could be some impact um, to their benefits. And again, you have to be in touch with your brokers on this. Some benefits plans do have an hours threshold. So you have to be uh, aware of that and figuring out um, you know, how this may impact employee benefits. When you're looking at a reduction in hours, you really should be looking at this for people who are non-exempt. Those are your, what I'm gonna call your hourly employees, the people who are eligible for overtime, not your exempt salaried employees. Um, because exempts, if somebody is an, an exempt salary employees, employee, they shouldn't be, you shouldn't be tracking hours for the purposes of um, overtime. They, they get a flat salary no matter how many hours they work. 
with a reduction in hours, the employee may be eligible for unemployment if the hours reduction is significant enough. So if you go to it from a five day work week to a two day work week, that employee may be el eligible to apply to unemployment for uh, a partial benefit based upon the fact that their pay is, has been significantly reduced due to the reduction in hours. The other type of reduction you can do is a salary reduction. What is that? It's a pay cut. Your, your employee is basically pay, paid less for doing the same job and working the same hours. The benefits are gonna remain unchanged, so you, sh you shouldn't have a benefits problem. There may be some notice requirements and each state has specific laws on this, but when you change somebody's rate of pay or salary, you may have to provide them written notice. Um, and in some states, there may be a time period in which you have to provide the written notice. So you should, uh, if you're gonna cut salaries, you should just make sure you've got your state laws, um, you've, take, you've taken a look at your state laws to make sure you've given the employee the notice. The notice is typically effective X date, you're gonna go from you know, $30 an hour to $25 an hour or whatever it is. Um, this can be done for an employee who is exempt or salaried or non-exempt or hourly. The only thing you have to watch out for are you can't go below the minimum wage. And if you have an exempt employee, somebody who is, who is exempt from overtime, you can't go below the overtime uh, exempt threshold, which um, for exempt executive administrative um, employees, the federal exemption is $684 per week. States may vary that. Some states are, are well north of that. So you need to check that out if you are gonna be cutting salaries. And if you are doing a salary reduction where you're just, the employee is gonna be paid a little bit less, that employee will not be eligible for unemployment. So if you are considering a reduction in force, what are some of the things that you should be considering and what are some of the questions that I've seen a lot of clients ask? The first thing many of my clients say to me is, do I have to pay severance? If I, if I lay somebody off or if I furlough somebody, do I have to pay severance? Um, the answer is most likely no. If your employee is an at-will employee, you don't have to pay severance. Um, some collective bargaining agreements require you to pay severance. And if you have a severance plan, which I'm guessing that a lot of smaller businesses would not have, you would re be required to pay severance. And if the employee was under some sort of a contract, uh, an employment contract that had a severance trigger, then you would have to pay severance. That said, severance in exchange for release release where the employee would be able to not come back and sue you if, um, you know, for any reason, it, once they take the severance payment, is always a good idea. A, you know, a month ago, I would have said severance should be an absolute must whenever you do a reduction in force. You should give the employee a little something, have them sign the release, and then close your eyes and go to bed without worrying that that employee may come back and sue you. I realize that we're in very difficult economic times and severance is a luxury, but to the extent it's available, it's still a good idea for the reasons it was a good idea a month ago. Um, you know, I, the COVID-19 crisis is going to last longer than any of us want it to, but it will not likely survive the statute of limitations for discrimination and other types of employment claims that your employees could bring against you. So, you know, if it's possible, um, and again, I realize there's economic considerations that may make it not possible, um, it's, it's a good idea that you should, you should think about if, if it's available. Another thing you have to think about, especially in terms of a layout, a layoff is state uh, laws and your policies may require you to pay out your accrued PTO, the vacation and sick time that the employee has accrued. So when you're fi figuring your financial 
um, budget for the layout, you know, it, a layoff, you would have to think about, you know, do these people have accrued PTO time that I have to now pay them? Another thing, and whenever we do any kind of a reduction in force, and this be, be a layoff, a furlough, a salary change, a reduction in hours, you've got to consider protected classes. Um, you know, at some point after this crisis, the plaintiff's attorneys are going to pounce and they're going to find your employees. And they're going to try to bring discrimination claims against all these employers who terminated people. So you want to look and see, you know, if you have anybody who is in a protected class. By protected class, I mean things like race, gender, religion, the new FMLA and sick leave laws that we just talked about. Um, and you want to make sure that you're not targeting those individuals for the layoff or the reduction in force, okay? It doesn't mean you can't fire somebody who's in a protected class, but you want to make sure you're applying these, these um, reductions in a manner that's consistent and across the board and that you're treating everybody on a similar way. And to that end, you've got to come up with a reasonable justification for the RIF that you're deciding to do, okay? Um, a lot of people say, okay, well, my reasonable legitimate reason is my business is closed or my customers are, are not coming into my store or my sales are down and I can't afford to pay these people. That's a good reason. But if you're not applying it across the board to everyone and you're selectively choosing one employee over the other, you're gonna have to have a reason why you picked you know, John over Mary or whatever the employee is, you know, why you chose to keep one and let another one go, or you're opening yourself up to a possible uh, discrimination claim down the road. And the last thing you want to do is navigate through this crisis, get your business through this crisis, and then, you know, finally, you know, get back onto level ground and be hit with, with a lawsuit. So just think about coming up with what the legitimate reason is. Other consideration for reductions in force is the CARES Act. The CARES Act is this bill that just passed the Senate um, yesterday. That act has in it an ability for a lot of businesses like yours to get relief from the government. Some of that relief is in the form of a loan that can be forgiven for your payroll costs. And what the act is saying is that if you terminate a portion of your workforce or you lay off a portion of your workforce or you furlough them and you don't bring them back, you may be eligible for less of a benefit. Act is still hasn't even passed the house yet. So we're still sorting through, through exactly what the, the criteria is. But again, before you make the decision on, you know, whether or not to, to trigger a reduction in force, you may want to consider what that new act has in terms of your available for future relief, or if you're in a position to, you may, you know, even if you do a reduction in force or you've already done a reduction in force, you may have to bring some of those employees back to get the full benefit. Um, so I just want to make you aware of that. Now, I know I've thrown an awful lot of information at, at everyone, and this is a very confusing time. So I want to give you a couple of places where you can find additional um, information. One is, I think, cdc.gov um, and your state and local health authorities is something you guys should be looking at almost on a daily basis. CDC has a section um, for employers, um, especially those businesses that are operating in terms of, you know, what you should be doing. They have some great resources, so, 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 so you know, be on the lookout and be monitoring that. Um, the DOL, which is the Department of Labor, that is where you can find information on the Families First Act that we've talked about. And I have um, given you a hyperlink to the poster that you are required to post in your workplace. Um, that poster, I, I understand, is also going to be made available on the AVB Brand Source website. And then finally, there is a link to my firm's website. And as I said earlier in the program, we have put up a and are continuing to put up a number of alerts on the various different 
um, guidance and statutes and legislation that is coming out. So we're trying to keep everyone abreast of that as well. And I invite you to, to take a look at that. Um, so I thank all of you for your time and um, I'll throw it back to Tom. The presentation is done. Um, this information will be recorded and posted on the COVID Info Hub website. So thank you guys all for um, watching this and hopefully it was helpful. Have a good day.